del Centro Cultural en Bookstore en Abuelas en Acción, a multicultural podcast for our common We welcome you to a conversation with Priscilla Solis Ibarra, author of Writing the Good Life, Mexican-American Literature and the Environment. I am Marie Dahlstrom, and I'm here with my comadres, Dr. Rosemary Celaya Alston and Consuelo Zaragoza. We're so honored to have Priscilla as our guest tonight to launch our 2022 Climate Comadres series and thank all of you for joining us. Many Latinx and other communities of color have viewed the white environmentalist movement as not having a place for us, for our lived experiences and our values. We see our lives and experiences in Priscilla's book, Writing the Good Life. She reminds us that we're all environmentalists and inspires us to look to Latinx writers and poets who speak truths about colonialism and its harm to our people and our natural resources. Priscilla reminds us that our hope for a life-sustaining Madre Tierra, Mother Earth, depends on all of us, depends on a return to good life values of simplicity, su sustenance, dignity, and respect. Climate Comadres hopes that our special event tonight in partnership with Dia Chuchas will evoke in all of us the desire to share our stories, our experiences, our truths, and to guide us in action for a just and sustainable earth. We are inspired by what esteemed poet laureate and Tia Chucha's co-founder, Luis Rodriguez has said, my task is to make you hear, to make you feel, and above all, to make you see. That's all and it is everything. Thank you, Ugarte and Brian Reyes and the entire Tia Chucha's team for all they did to make this event possible. And thank you to Familias en Acción in Portland, Oregon for their wonderful support for our podcast. You can purchase Writing the Good Life through Tia Chucha's with the link available on chat. And please post your comments and questions on the chat as Priscilla will respond to these after her reading. Priscilla Solisi Barra is a writer and associate professor in the Department of English at the University of North Texas. Her publications include Writing the Good Life, Mexican American Literature and the Environment in 2016, co-editor of Latinx Environmentalism's Place, Justice, and the Decolonial, 2019. For 2021-2022, she is Clement Senior Fellow for the Study of Southwestern America at Southern Methodist University. She is also one of 20 individuals that has been selected for the inaugural class of the Rethink Outside Fellowship, which elevates and supports leaders and storytellers who transform the outdoor equity narrative. Priscilla holds numerous distinguished roles and memberships on boards and has been elected to serve terms on the Executive Council of the Association for the Study of Literature and Environment on the Executive Committee of the Western Literature Association and on the Board of Directors of Orion Magazine. She is passionate about stories that subvert the ideas of private property and the hierarchy of power and its structure. Pr Priscilla enjoys hiking, kayaking, but anytime she's outdoor, she pays attention to the birds. Birding is at the top of the activity that connects her to the environment, to cyclical timing, and a meditative sense of peace with being with nature. Welcome, Priscilla. 
Thank you so much. What a beautiful introduction. I'm so honored to receive this uh, invitation to speak with you all. Thank you for offering space for, for this work that I feel is for our whole community and that I wrote with my family in mind and with our community in mind. I want to start with um, a land acknowledgement uh, to acknowledge the lands of the peoples from where I am speaking from what is now known as the North Texas area, which um, are the lands of the Wichita and uh, Caddo affiliated tribes, as well as a, a point of um, juncture for uh, Comanche and Apache. Um, the town that I'm speaking to you from, Denton, was named for John B. Denton, who committed genocide against these peoples um, at a time when Texas was also uh, starting and uh, founding the Texas Rangers in the um, uh, 19th century that committed violence against uh, our ancestors, against my ancestors here, uh, Mexicans and indigenous peoples. So I want to uh, recognize that I'm speaking from the lands that have been stewarded by these um, cultures uh, over you know, the past and, and up to the present day. Um, I will also just um, you know, let you know that um, the, the way that I'm gonna go about this is give you kind of a brief um, summary of the book and then do a short reading, read about just about 15 minutes. And then I'm really looking forward to the conversation that we're gonna have. I had just an amazing conversation with um, Marie and Rosemary on the podcast already. So I'm looking forward to this conversation too. Uh, so just briefly, um, the overview of the book, you know, the, um, the first thing I wanna say is that in preparing for this presentation, I looked back at some notes that I had made in 2016 when I was giving a, another talk about this book. And I realized that on that occasion, um, I dedicated that reading and that lecture to um, two movements going on at that time period. The Black Lives Matter movement that was uh, still very new, you know, that was, um, founded a, around the response to um, Mike Brown's uh, killing in um, Ferguson um, in 2014. And also with um, the Standing Rock and um, uh, organ organizing against the Dakota Access Pipeline uh, that was going on in 2016. And I dedicated my lecture that day in October um, to both of these movements. And I was just thinking today, you know, so much time has passed and some things have changed, but also not a lot has changed. Um, but I feel like uh, I have a continued commitment to those movements. So I want to once again, uh, dedicate this lecture to both the Black Lives Matter movement and to the Land Back movement that is all about, you know, getting rid of extractive industries uh, from our lands and valuing the peoples who inhabit our lands and deconstructing these hierarchical values of power that Rosemary so generously mentioned in her introduction of me, because that really is a central tenet of what I, I look at. And I see those uh, movements as really intersecting uh, under the umbrella of abolition and abolitionist movements today. So I can speak to that a little more later, but certainly the seeds of my commitment to abolition uh, were already there and were germinating and were part of the inspiration for this book that I'm talking about today. So I just wanted to set the tone a little bit with that. Um, but this book, uh, in the introduction, I really start out by engaging in the moment in 2013 that was immediately following um, a speech that Barack Obama, then President Barack Obama gave about climate change. And the TV personality, Bill Maher, in, uh, invited a Yale climate change um, communication expert, uh, Anthony Larowitz onto his program. And he, he said, you know, uh, Anthony, you've done this research and you figured out that the ethnic group that cares the most about climate change is Hispanics. Why is that? And 
you know, the researcher looks at Bill and Bill looks at the researcher and they both say, I don't know, I, I, I wish I knew more about why that is. And I'm sitting there in my seat, you know, having worked on this book already for a while and saying, I know the answer to that question. So kind of, you know, this book is kind of a response to that that there's all kinds of reasons um, behind that. And I just really wanted to make visible the uh, richness um, with which we contribute to the environmental conversation from the Latino, Hispanic, Mexican-American uh, background. And not just that poll from uh, Yale Climate Change Communication Project, but from um, the New York Times, uh, at least six other polls at that time that were documented. And there's more now, which we reviewed in Latinx environmentalisms too. So, what is the answer to that question then? So that's what I was working on um, with that book, with this book. And one thing is um, one part of the kind of disconnect, uh, why you know these these two um, you know educated, well-informed um, scholars and and TV personalities um, don't have an explanation for that. Part of it is because, you know, um, Latinos, Mexican Americans are not viewed as environmentalists. Um, the popular image of environmentalists is not necessarily someone with brown skin or dark skin, right? So that's, that's one factor. But the other side of that equation is that um, Mexican Americans, Latinxes don't often identify as environmentalists. And I had to kind of figure out what's going on sort of um, at the intersection of those two disidentifications. And one thing I came up with, and I could have stopped the study at this point, is to say, well, the place where both of those things meet for identity for people of color and the concept of environmentalism is with the concept of environmental justice, that we bring attention to the ways in which um, not just Latinxes, but people of color, working class really endure the consequences of our exploitate of, of global exploita exploitative practices against the land. And um, we bring visibility to that and we critique it and we organize against it, right? So that's very important, but I didn't want it to seem like we're just reacting to um, those more recent injustices. What I wanted to do is show that this is in continuity with 500 years of colonization and to show that not only have we been reacting to the exploitation, but we have our own cultural knowledge, our own uh, practices, ways of being and thinking that we have protected from the exploitative practices of colonization, of capitalism, of extractive industries. Now, this is not perfect, of course. Um, this is not universal. This is a generalization that I'm making, but I, would, I managed to be able to make this claim and back it up with evidence from 150 years of writing, of literature. So there's something to it. I recognize that it's not perfect. And there are those of us who are just as, you know, capitalist and exploitative as, as the next um, industrialist. But there's something in our culture that's um, worth protecting. There's a lot in our culture that's worth um, looking to and, and uh, promoting and making more visible. And that's the way that I wanted to kind of show the intersection between Latinx culture, Mexican American culture and environmental issues. Um, so this book is really um, amplifying what a decolonial lens can do to help us learn uh, about um, what Mexican American culture has to offer to the environmental conversation. And all that means is that I ask the question, you know, how has colonization impacted the human relationship with the natural environment for Mexican Americans? And I ask that question consistently across from the middle of the um, ninth, middle to late part of the 19th century. Um, up to the year 2010. And there's two main ways that um, I saw, you know, some, some general patterns that I saw 
in terms of a response to that question of how colonization has impacted our relationship with the natural environment. And one way is mestizo culture itself, that, that Mexican American identity is not purely anything. We're, if anything, we're a pure mixture, right? Of, um, of in, indigenous, many different indigenous nations um, that encountered the European colonizers, Spanish colonizers, um, even uh, some Asian mixtures, some black um, mixtures. Uh, we're a, a big mixture and we gain strength from that, um, from that uh, mixture of culture. We also carry with us uh, ways of knowing um, in that mixture. So I don't want that to sound like it's an erasure of um, any of those original contributions, but we are a culture that carries a lot of those ways of knowing and being with us. Um, and then another way that um, colonization has impacted our relationship with the natural environment is that we have um, not universally, not holistically, but there are those of us across the years, you know, 500 years of colonization who have said, we reject that those exploitative hierarchical values and we maintain um, more reciprocal um, uh, sustenance oriented, simplicity oriented values. Um, and in a way it's been like two sides of a coin, right? The, where there's been the exploitative, but then there are those of us who have maintained those um, uh, values that maintain a better relationship with the natural environment. So the, the argument that I end up making is that we never became environmentalists in the first place. We already had values that enabled a um, healthier relationship with the natural environment because we did not see it as external. We did not see it as an enemy. Um, but then I had a problem because my whole project was about Mexican Americans in the environment. And if I wasn't going to call it Mexican American environmental literature, then what was I going to call it? So that's why the title of my book um, is called Writing the Good Life. And I decided to call it Good Life Writing because that term resonates with, um, first of all, you know, writing by uh, Mexican Americans in the US, but also with um, other movements across Latin America that are uh, enacting values of reciprocity and sustenance and simplicity and against possession. In um, uh, South America, it's called Buen, Vivi Buen Vivir, or um, in Quechua, the term is like the good path, which is sumac cause. So many different cultures across Latin America are embracing this idea. And I found the term in a book by um, Fabiola Cabeza de Vaca that she published in 1949. It was a cookbook and she wrote an introduction to that cookbook um, where she talked about what life was like on the Llano Estacado in Eastern New Mexico where she grew up and she called it, you know, life was, she said that life was good and they focused on simplicity and sustenance and reciprocity. And the title for that book was The Good Life. So I thought, well, there's my, there's my term. So um, I use the term, of course, environmentalism and we're using it in our conversation, but I also wanted to find a term that really resonates with these other movements. Um, and just to give you a, a brief overview, I'm not gonna go over um, all the chapters, but um, to give you a sense, you know, the, the introduction, of course, just gives you the, the general argument of the book, but then the first substantive uh, chapter that uh, engages with literature is um, engaging with literature that was written or set during the U.S.-Mexico War, because it's a very important period in the history of Mexican-American culture, because that's a time when, you know, the U.S., takes half of Mexico's territory and about 100,000 Mexicans decide to stay, you know, the border cross them and um, their relationship with the land that they had um, established, uh, granted uh, through colonization, but the relationship with the land that they had established was then, you know, broken and they were no longer um, in charge of what to do with the land at that point. So that's a very important cultural moment for Mexican Americans. So I deal with uh, writers Jovita Gonzalez and Maria Amparo Ruiz de Burton, 
Louise de Burton, just a fascinating figure, you know, published a novel in 1872 and 1885, the first one under a pen name. Um, and then I go into the early uh, 20th century period that's more like um, internal looking um, inquiries by these writers, Sabine Olivari, um, Fabiola Cabeza de Vaca, uh, Adelina Otero Warren are some of the writers that I deal with there. And then I get into more like the, the civil rights era, the middle of the 20th century, but I did not see that lesson represented in any of my courses or the scholarship that I read after I left home. My parents sent me to the university to learn what I needed to know in order to succeed. As it turns out, they had already taught me how to make a unique contribution to the field of environmental studies and Chicana and Chicano literary studies. I know that I'm not the only low income first generation college student from an ethnic minority background who aspires to tell her parents' story through her life's work. Explicit or not, their thoughts, stories, and experiences show up on every page of my writing. So you should know that neither of my parents ever attended school. My father, Encarnacion Peña Ibarra, was born in 1918 under a tree in Kaufman, Texas, with the growing city of Dallas nearby. At the time, Dallas's finance and banking empires were just getting their start. Love Field Airport was a mere training area for aspiring pilots, and Southern Methodist University had only been around for three years. Busy meeting their basic needs, the Ibarra clan did not take part in the finance, aviation, or educational aspects of the city's enterprise. My father was an older sibling in a group of 12 who, with their parents, traveled the migrant farm worker circuit from near the border with Mexico to near that with Canada and back. He told me stories from his tough childhood and youth during the Great Depression. As Américo Paredes, born in 1915, puts in his novel, George Washington Gomez, the Mexicans couldn't take a job if there were Anglos who wanted it. If a Mexican did get a job, he was paid at best half the wage of an Anglo because the bosses reasoned that Mexicans could get by with less. The bosses tell the Mexicans that the Anglo, quote, needs more money to live on, you can do with less, end quote. I first heard that story from my dad. And when I read it in Paredes' novel, my dad's voice rang in my ear once again. My father's parents, on the move and always looking for work, figured it wasn't worthwhile to put the children into a school from which they must promptly remove them to look for work farther down the line. Tomas Rivera describes this migrant life in And the Earth Did Not Devour Him. Unlike the little boy in that book who did go to school, my dad helped his family survive by working in the fields and somehow eventually taught himself how to read and write in Spanish and then in English. He even learned how to play a pretty good accordion and bajo sexto, a 12 string bass guitar, not to mention the six string guitar. And he put together his own conjunto band in Dallas during the 1960s. By the time I showed up in his life, he was a truck driver running a delivery route from Dallas to Houston and Galveston and back. I traveled back and forth on the same road when I was going to graduate school at Rice University. I thought of him often wishing I could tell him just one or, the, one or two of the things I was learning about, things that in many ways he had already taught me. My dad died in 1991 just a month short of his 73rd birthday. I was 17 years old and halfway through my junior year in high school. Before he died, he tried to catch my adolescent attention long enough to get me to help with the garden he kept in our backyard. And I wish I had paid more attention to what he shared with me about how to help things grow. Still, some lessons took root. I remember one lesson in particular, he would ask my older brother and then me what they taught us in school about Texas history. My father read a lot of books, especially history books, and he wanted us to know the Mexican side as well as the American and Texan side 
of Texas history. My father, <clears throat> oh, sorry, even taking us on trips to the Alamo and to the San Jacinto Monument. Taking a busman's holiday, he would drive us to South Texas, hauling our secondhand pop-up trailer behind our yellow and white Chevy pickup. The four of us crammed into the bench seat and our dog Fido, a mostly German shepherd mutt with floppy ears, lying on the floorboard at our feet. We'd find an RV park to perch our trailer. My mom would cook us our rice and beans, papas con carne and fresh flour tortillas, just, to, just like at home. And my dad took us to the monument, told us to pay attention to him rather than to the guides and listen to our questions and reactions as if we really had something to say. I recall those trips often and wish I'd had my dad by my side when I first read Caballero, Jovita Gonzalez's novel that tells the Mexican side of the Texas War of Independence from Mexico and with his pistol in his hand, Américo Paredes's demystification of the Texas Rangers. My father was the first teacher to show me how to question master narratives. My mother, Maria Eugenia Solis Ibarra was born in 1938 on a rural ejido in Northern Mexico, outside the big border city of Matamoros. She was abandoned by her mother shortly after her birth and her father was killed when she was only one year old. She was raised with her only sibling, a brother four years older in her ejido community called La Venada by her father's aunt. A pair of orphans in an agricultural community considered themselves lucky to be able to earn their keep by working. And my mother and uncle worked steadily on the lands, some of those lands willed to them by their dead father. Their work kept them from the small local school, but a teacher took personal responsibility for their education and visited them at home when they could learn the early stages of reading, writing, and basic arithmetic. Still, their primary concern was with farming and the accompanying challenges of a rural life. I grew up hearing about how to grow cotton and watermelons and plants that can cure a wide range of ailments. I'm still trying to learn those lessons from my mother, who mastered not only farming techniques, but the natural history of the Rio Grande Valley and a boundless knowledge of herbal remedies, all without formal schooling. When I was a kid, I always wondered why everybody else in our little town had neatly trimmed lawns while ours teemed with a chaos of weeds. And these days we call those weeds native species and we call that style of lawn uh, native landscaping and having one design costs a lot of money. Despite her love for her childhood agricultural community, my mother left her home at age 18 and arrived young and completely alone in Houston, Texas in search of her mother. Arriving in the United States as a young woman with no education, no English and very limited resources, my mother made her own way in defiance of the intersectional discriminations she encountered every day. My mother taught me the fierce independence of a strong woman who never thinks twice about taking meaningful risks, forging an unconventional path and connecting with place through knowledge and cultivation of local ecology. It's her voice I hear when Rudolfo Anaya's Ultima speaks and her remedies that resonate with the curanderismo I find in Patri Patricia Preciada Martin's songs my mother sang to me. I am extremely fortunate to have my parents' lives to remind me that the ways to address our current environmental and many other problems do not always lie in the future or in the new. We can learn so much by paying attention to those around us, even if, or especially because, they are not the ones we conventionally look to for wisdom and insight. I'll stop there and um, I look forward to your questions. Oh, oh my goodness, Priscilla. Yeah. I have a few tears <laughs> because I think it's really so important to um, know that side of you, to understand your writing. And thank you for letting us know what the whole book consists of. Um, I want to remind our listeners to make sure that you have comments or questions to please let us know. 
Your work has been committed to understanding the lives and the ways of knowing from your family's history, which highlights labor, social justice, and resilience. Like so many of us who know the challenging journeys that our families have taken through whatever pathway they, they had to do, yet still remained humbled and given, given one more day. So I think you've answered this in part, but if you could elaborate just a little bit more, how can writing help each of us draw from our rich family and cultural histories, especially our indigenous roots, our feminine, on, on our own journey for just, for just and thriving our earth? Yeah, that's a really great question. Thank you. Um, I, I guess I, I would like to reflect on just like what writing is and what writing does for us. Um, I think that uh, the fact that I shared the preface that helped me to work through so much of um, what was sort of blocking my process with, with writing this book by just asking myself, um, why are you writing this book? And then that just opened up you know, a series of questions, one right after the other. So I really um, see writing as um, a, a structure of interrogation. <laughs> it's, it's really about asking questions. Um, I like to, to say to my students, you know, because I teach writing in my college courses, I like to say to my students, you know, no one in here is allowed to say that they don't like to read or that they don't like to write. And with the writing one, I say, you know, if, if you say that you don't like to write, then, it, then it, you're basically saying that you don't know how, you don't like how, you don't like thinking. Because I see writing as just a, a process of thinking on the page. And it, it assists you in organizing your ideas. And then once you see them kind of laid out on the page, then you can start the process of interrogation. And you ask yourself, you know, uh, why did I put this idea next to that one? Did I really mean that? Um, what is the you know, what is the big gap between these two questions that I'm asking and I seem to have answered here? Um, so in that way, we can start to, of course, as, uh, you know, members of, of cultures that are not represented generally in the mainstream, it's very important for us to uh, go through that process of interrogation and, and self-interrogation. And um, the, the specific, of course, um, specialty that I have cultivated is about narrative. You know, how, how do stories help us to um, analyze what's going on in, in our everyday lives and what stories are we telling ourselves um, historically and how can we retell those stories? Like when some of the, the most powerful um, writers that I uh, engaged with when I was a young woman and in my twenties, um, not in my college classrooms, but outside of my college classrooms when I was reading Sandra Cisneros and Denise Chavez and Gloria Saldua, um, uh, artists like Esther Hernandez, who were taking some of the um, iconic images of women, you know, the Virgen de Guadalupe and Guadalique and Kodo Shauki. And there were certain narratives about who those women were for us in our culture of, you know, submissive or um, not as powerful as they turn out to be, or, you know, fitting into patriarchal hierarchies. Those writers, you know, from the 80s and 90s really changed uh, our view of them. So uh, that's one of the powerful things that we can do is just, you know, turn narratives around upside down, turn them on their heads. Thank you. Consuelo. Oh, I think you're muted, Consuelo. Thank you. That's a habit. Um, thank you again so much for. Um, sharing what you're sharing as Rosemary, I had a few tears and definitely remembered my grandmothers um, and the land and the gardens and 
you know, just the beautiful tierra. So thank you. Um, my question for you is, oh, and I think you've answered this in, in some ways, but why is reading so important? And can you share what that we should be reading? Of course, I, I ask my students to read a great deal. And I tell them when they come into my class, there's a lot of reading in this class, you know, uh, but you're going to love the, the work that we're doing here. Um, and some of what I say is that, you know, I, I say to them, look, um, reading is a practice of cultivating attention. And in these days when, you know, there, there's so many distractions, getting to sit down and, and put your full attention on, on one um, writer's work, on one narrative with one book, you know, old school technology, it's just such a privilege. Um, and as much as we can cultivate that deep sense of attention, I think that it really um, can help us with anything else that we're doing, you know, to, to practice that kind of focus. Um, the other thing that reading um, offers, you know, the, the typical thing is that, you know, the, that people usually say about reading is that it helps you to experience, uh, you know, worlds that you might not otherwise uh, get to experience, right? And um, of course, that's true. And that was certainly the case for, for this, you know, working class uh, Mexicanita that was just like, oh my God, so, so many worlds that I engaged with just through books when I was growing up. Um, but, you know, I, I want to dig a little deeper with that, um, that whole thing about how it opens up new worlds for you. And um, just the the understanding of what narrative is can open up new worlds for you because stories are such a dominant way of, or is the way that we understand what's happening to us, what's happening to other people. And if you are in the practice of constantly analyzing what a narrative is in a book, out in the real world, you're also going to start ask, asking those questions, right? What story is somebody trying to tell me to get me to do something? Or what story am I telling myself about, you know, really going on with me that there's, there's some Something traumatic in this project that I'm trying to do and I I can then pay attention to that and work through it or you know a whole range of of possibilities so so reading can can offer us that practice of analyzing narratives and it also offers us this opportunity to hold many different perspectives at once mm -hmm. so that again we cultivate this, um, this practice of asking questions. You know, I'm not the only one who thinks this way, but someone else is having a different experience. And, and what kind of questions can I ask them to, to find out what, what their narrative is of the thing that we're experiencing? And of course, then that develops that um, empathy muscle, which we need so very much um, in order to in, encounter and and hold each other in a certain re regard and respect and with you know reciprocal respect that can help us get through so many of the challenges that we're facing today. Thank you. Um, oh, and I didn't answer about the, yes. the, um, <laughs> the current writers. I'll just throw a, a few out there. I, I got my visual aids. Um, so this is a really great writer. Um, Stephanie Elizondo Greist. And this book, um, it's a couple of years old, but it's just wonderful, All the Agents and Saints. And uh, she writes about both, uh, both borders, the South and the North border. Uh, she's from Corpus Christi, Texas, but she write, writes about the Southern border um, between Texas and Mexico. And then she writes about the Northern border between New York and Canada. And she finds very resonant cultures with the um, Mexican American culture in the South and the Mohawk Aquasasani nation in the North. And there are so many environmental justice battles that both communities are facing and you know, with deep roots uh, ranging all the way back to 
colonization, capitalism, extractive industries, they're, they're fighting the same fight. And she thought, oh, let me do this book that um, will be about these two radically different cultures on the different borders. And she found herself seeing that there are so many resonances. It was like hanging out with her family when she was up there with the Aquasasni Nation. Um, so it's about toxicity, environmental justice, um, but also borders and identities and you know resonances um, between Mexican American and, and indigenous uh, cultures. So that's a great book. And this book, um, I'm sure you've seen it, um, but she's just a brilliant writer, you know, young writer. I'm, I'm really glad to see, you know, a fresh voice on the scene. Carla uh, Cornejo Villavicencio, The Undocumented Americans. I was just like, you know, I couldn't, couldn't set it down. And um, I'll, I'll uh, pitch one more, Native Country of the Heart by... Um, wonderful writer, Shuri Moraga, uh, memoir. Uh, she's written several memoirs. This is a, her most recent memoir that is about um, both cultural memory and her mother's memory and her mother's uh, battle with Alzheimer's. Uh, so th those are a few uh, recommendations that I, that I have. Thanks for asking. Absolutely, thank you. I'm gonna take a look at the chat to see if we have any questions here. Um, and while you're doing that, I am um, echo what you were saying about uh, uh, Shetty Moraga's uh, recent book. I was just talking today actually uh, about um, identifying with her. She says in the book, she, she grew up in Southern California like I did and grew up at the foothills of the San Gabriel, uh, in the San Gabriel Valley. And she never saw the mountain. And, you know, my husband and I are both from Southern California, and we don't remember seeing the mountains very much either. Um, that it, 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 it sh we didn't think there were mountains and, uh, until it rained, and maybe we would see them a couple of times. Um, and her book, along with Gloria Ansaldua, This Bridge Called My Back, changed my life. I read it uh, an act, uh, a, a white friend gave it to me and I couldn't put it down. It totally changed my my whole world. In our family, immigrants, we, I didn't know what the word feminism was. I didn't, uh, I just knew strong women. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I, I, I was taught to be a strong woman. And mm -hmm. to have all of read all of the different stories. And, uh, and for years, I, I just, I absorbed everything that, you know, Latinx, um, uh, Chicana, Mexicana, and never associated them with environmentalism mm. until I read your book with Latinx environmentalism and then I um, then found your book and mm -hmm. I also could not put it down. So I highly recommend that people find your book, buy your book, borrow your book. It is amazing and I had a sense, I, I, I felt you in every page and we, we talked about this on our podcast is that your parents, you know, I had this vision of your parents and the preface back, um, it was about that soul felt uh, journey that you needed to return to. And thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you. Absolutely. We have no questions, but a lot of hearts and clapping hands. <laughs> 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 Wonderful. I, I can share a photo of my parents if, if yes, that works. Yes, we'd love to see you. Yes. Please do. Um, let's see. I'll go to share screen. Um, can you see it there? Yeah. 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 Oh. Try to make it bigger. There. I'm about, I think I'm about 11 there. And that's my dad and my mom and my brother, Saulo. Mm -hmm. That's at my tia Manuela's house. Mm -hmm. We would spend many weekends there. <laughs> you know what I think is profound is that so many of our grandparents and great grandparents and my and our parents did not have the educational 
background that some of us do now. Mm -hmm. And yet they were our greatest teachers. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. And what you have done this evening is really profoundly continue to say the connection to our relationships and the connections to our environment are equal. They're the same. And there's a reflection there that you provided with us this evening on the insights of how writing and thinking and critical thinking and all of that stuff come together in the stories that we tell Mm -hmm. and the families and the journeys that they have. And I so appreciate. So I want to go back to something that Marie read that the founder of the Achucha said, my task is to make you hear, to make you feel, and above all, to make you see. That is all. And it's everything. (laughs) And you did that. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And, you know, the, the work that I'm doing um, these days is, is really looking at um, both the abolition movement and resonances um, across um, Mexican American culture and say movements like uh, the land back movement in um, uh, indigenous uh, studies and, you know, critical Latinx indigeneities. And so much of what's going on there is this emphasis on relationships that you bring up, Rosemary, and that it's about, you know, cultivating um, relationships rather than um, dealing with each other through power hierarchy, right? I mean, you know, po- po- hierarchies of power right. is a kind of relationship, right? But it's, right. Um, it's deconstructing those hierarchies so that we're face to face with each other. And it's, um, it, those are difficult relationships. And there's, you know, we, we should not idealize that or romanticize that process. But um, that is the way in which we can really uh, cultivate Uh, better practices and more respectful practices with one another and with with the land. Any other additional comments, Consuelo or Marie? I'll I'll just add again, um, you know, my my mom, my grandma was from New Mexico and Mm -hmm. we'd go and, and visit her often. And she had the most beautiful garden it was huge I mean all kinds of fruit trees Mm. and she had a well of fresh water um, in her um, backyard in her house and after um, my grandma passed and my tío um, sold the um, the land I went back to visit and, you know, part of the house was still the same. And so I went up and knocked on the door and asked the, the woman that lived there, you know, that it was my grandmother's land previously and can, could I walk on it? And uh, this makes me very emotional. And so as a little girl, I would go get water with my grandma and I thought it was so far away. <laughs> and so we, we walked and it was right there. And I just started laughing because as a little, little girl, I just thought I was, I was walking for, for miles and it was just almost right outside the door and it was just beautiful. So mm-hmm. thank you for, for um, letting that memory come back to me. Thank you. Thank you for sharing it. And, you know, I mean, when we're that and small, I, um, places are, are further away. And <laughs> we're also experiencing so much of the wonder of every single step, you know. And that's another gift of being is that reading uh, reminds us that every moment can open up into this whole world of attention, you know. And, and writers do that for us. They, they bring our, slow our attention down. So we are paying attention to each world that each step opens up for us. So I imagine that's part of what you were doing there, you know? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Thank you. So Priscilla, before we end, could you say a, a few words about Jimmy Santiago Baca. I um, I just bought his book today, and uh, uh, immigrants in our own land and selected early poems. I I don't know if you know uh, uh, many of us know who he is and such 
important uh, poet and, and the work that he, he, he has uh, uh, written. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for that question, Marie. Uh, Jimmy Santiago Baca is a poet from New Mexico. He's been publishing his poetry, geez, I think since like the 1970s. Um, and he started out um, as a, a poet behind bars. He was in prison um, and he was only semi-literate when he went into prison. Uh, he had had a, a rough childhood um, uh, kind of bouncing around between his parents and his grandparents and, and a hard time at school. So he's only semi-literate when he went into prison, but then there he, he kind of found um, language and poetry and, you know, um, writing letters back and forth with, with folks and, you know, learning that way and then you know, sending his poetry off to magazines to get published. So by the time he got out of prison, I think maybe two or three years, um, he had kind of a reputation as a poet and he's been publishing ever since then and runs writing workshops out of New Mexico and, you know, works with um, kids who share his background, you know, who, who might be struggling um, and has written not just um, poetry, but uh, fiction. Uh, he wrote a beautiful memoir about this life that I'm telling you about. There's a documentary film about his life as well. So there's lots of uh, resources out there to um, to get to know Jimmy Santiago Baca a little more. But he also um, has just a very, um, I write a, about him in my book too. Uh, he has a very deeply cultivated sense of place um about new mexico as a place uh, another collection of his poems is the black mesa poems and he and he writes about place with this um deeply uh cultivated you know sense of place and all of the layers of colonization and identity and power that has gone into shaping the place of new mexico so just a fantastic um, poet. I only met him once very briefly when I was in graduate school in Houston, so I don't know him, but uh, just fantastic work. Thank you, Priscilla, again, for this heartfelt moment with you. This has been amazing. And buddy, that you can order writing The Good Life from Tia Chucha's books at tiachucha.org. As Priscilla has reminded us we are all environmentalists with the and we have along with that we have the responsibility to act. We can act by talking with our families, with our children, our grandchildren about this event and about writing the good life. We can choose one action for our sustainable earth, the community that will heal our earth will be all of us together. Comadres, any last any last thoughts before we end? Loved it. Yes. Gracias. Priscilla, you Thank are you a so comadre much. now. Thank you so much. I'm honored to be a comadre too. <laughs> Thank you for Muchas being gracias. with us. And join Climate Comadres on Abuelas en Acción, a multicultural podcast for our common good. Buenas noches. Buenas noches. Buenas noches. Buenas noches.